Hello, good day. This will be your discussion on peripheral vascular diseases. So this slide is intended for level 3 students of Central Philippine University. If you have any questions regarding the presentation, it may be emailed to gjsporque at cpu.edu.ph. Let us talk about the basic concepts in the care of your patient with peripheral vascular disorders. Our peripheral vascular system is crucial in both adequate perfusion and adequate blood flow. So adequate perfusion would ensure that our organs in the peripheral aspect of our body are adequately oxygenated and it receives the proper nourishment that it should have. Adequate blood flow is dependent on the following factors. One, efficient heart pumping. So the more efficient the pumping of the heart is, the more likely that the blood will be able to reach the periphery. Second is blood vessel patency. So our blood vessels may also be altered in terms of patency, which means that if our blood vessels are narrowed, such as in conditions atherosclerosis, there is a tendency that the blood flow towards our periphery would be obstructed. Other reason could be vasospasm. And then your circulating blood volume. Despite the efficiency of the heart pumping and then the blood vessel patency, if the blood volume is inadequate, Okay, the blood flow will not be able to reach our peripheral aspect. Hence, the oxygenation and nourishment of our body will be affected. To understand our peripheral vascular system, we need to familiarize ourselves and review these terms. Arteries. So when we talk about arteries, they carry your oxygenated blood or technically they carry blood away from the body. Okay, you're looking at that definition away from the body that would include your pulmonary artery. Now, your arteries is divided into three layers. So you have your intima, media, and adventitia. The intima is the innermost layer, intima, innermost layer, and it is composed of endothelial tissues. Then you have your media. Your media is composed of smooth muscles and elastic tissues. Adventitia, on the other hand, is composed of connective tissues. Arterioles. Your arterioles are like your small arteries, and they're often referred to as resistance vessels. The reason for this is that they have a role in arterial pressure regulation. Then you have your capillaries. Your capillaries are considered to be single layer of endothelial cells. The exchange of oxygenated blood okay, with the waste products and other waste products and carbon dioxide takes place in capillaries. Then you have your veins and venules. Comparing the veins and the arteries, your veins would have thinner and less muscular walls compared to your arterioles or your arteries, I mean. So uh, your veins are considered to be more distensible compared to your arteries. Let us talk about the functions of the vascular system. So your vascular system has several functions that includes circulatory needs of tissues. So in the circulatory needs of tissues, these are affected by the following factors. One is the rate of tissue metabolism, availability of oxygen, and then the function of tissue. Now, let's discuss the rate of tissue metabolism. In terms of rate of tissue metabolism, when the metabolic needs would increase, the blood vessels would dilate. Okay, the purpose of dilation there is to allow for the flow of blood to provide oxygen and nutrients. Again, when the metabolic needs of the body increase, the tendency of your blood vessels is to dilate, specifically to the part where the metabolic need arises. And the purpose of that is to provide that specific part with oxygen and nutrients. On the other hand, on the decrease of the metabolic needs, the blood vessels are more likely to constrict. Then that is because uh, there is a decreased need of oxygen and nutrients to the specific part of the body. When we talk about physical activity or exercise, we expect physical activity and exercise to increase the metabolic needs of the body. Hence, we would expect that the blood vessels would dilate. Heat application. Oftentimes, we encounter management wherein we apply warm compress to our patient. So when we say heat application, your heat application is intended to reduce swelling. Swelling is reduced when there is vasodilation. Okay? In other words, okay, you are trying or the body is trying to reabsorb the swell okay, or the fluids contained on the swelling of your patient. Now, local cold application. Your local cold application is expected to constrict your blood vessels. Okay, so that is uh, uh, congruent to your rest, decreased physical exercises, and cooling of the body. So if you're in the air-conditioned room, the tendency is for your blood vessels to constrict. Now, if the blood vessels would fail to dilate, despite the increased metabolic need, there will be tissue ischemia. 
Because again, supposedly, when you have an increased metabolic need, your blood vessels should dilate. If there is a failure of dilation on that part, tissue ischemia would occur because the oxygen and metabolic needs of your body is not being provided. Now, availability of oxygen. So your blood vessels okay, are more likely to react also on the availability of oxygen. If your body perceives that there is lack of oxygen in a certain part, okay, the tendency is to increase the blood flow going to that specific part. Okay? Take in, for example, the decrease of blood flow or decrease of oxygen going towards your kidney. On that response, your kidney will try to produce erythropoietin. And then functions of tissues. So for example, during uh, gastrointestinal intake or during or after food intake, the tendency of your circulatory system is to divert the circulation towards your gastrointestinal tract in such a way that mm, circulation is focused on the metabolism of your food intake. Let's talk about blood flow. So your blood flow is unidirectional in our body. That is ensured by the difference between the arterial and the venous pressure. Arterial pressure is said to be higher, it's 100 millimeter mercury, compared to your venous pressure, which is 40 millimeter mercury. Also, your blood flow is affected by your blood viscosity. So, when the blood viscosity increases, when the blood rate or the blood flow rate increases, and when the diameter of the blood vessel became greater than normal, or it may become narrowed or constricted, the blood flow tends to become turbulent. Okay, the blood flow tends to become turbulent. Then blood pressure. We also have capillary filtration and reabsorption. Your capillary filtration and reabsorption talks about the fluid exchange between the capillary walls. And this fluid exchange is said to be continuous. The function of capillary filtration and reabsorption is a balance between your hydrostatic pressure and osmotic pressure. When I talk about hydrostatic pressure, it is a driving pressure that is generated by your blood pressure. On the other hand, your osmotic pressure is the pressure driven by your plasma proteins. That's why if our patient would have decrease of plasma proteins, we are likely to encounter a patient with edema because the pressure that makes the fluid stay inside the blood vessels is gone. And that is the role of your protein. Then we have your hemodynamic resistance. Your hemodynamic resistance okay, is determined by the radius of your blood vessels. Small changes in the blood vessel radius lead to large changes in resistance. And the resistance is proportional also to the viscosity or thickness of the blood and the length of the blood vessels. Let's talk about the assessment of your vascular system. When acquiring the subjective data, one of the important history that you need to ask is the occurrence of intermittent claudication. So when we say intermittent claudication, it is a muscular cramp type of pain or discomfort or fatigue in the extremities. Okay, this is reproduced in same degree of exercise or activity and relieved by rest. The cause of this is that despite the increased demands of the extremities, there is still inadequate blood flow, which is brought about by uh, narrowing of your blood vessels or uh, vasospasms. It is worse at night and may interfere with the sleep. And uh, an intervention that might help your patient is to lower down or to place the leg on a dependent position to improve the perfusion to the peripheral tissues. And then intermittent claudication is also a symptom of generalized atherosclerosis and may be a marker of occult coronary artery disease. During inspection, the following signs and symptoms may be noted. One, cool and pale extremities, which would indicate poor perfusion. Rubor, your reddish and bluish discoloration of the extremities can be observed within 20 seconds to 2 minutes after the extremity is placed on dependent position. Usually, if your patient would elevate the extremity affected by rubor, the extremity will begin to turn pale. Patient may also manifest with signs of cyanosis, which is again a late sign of oxygenation problem. The loss of hair, brittle nails, dry or scaling skin, atrophy, and ulcerations all indicate poor tissue perfusion to those respective parts. Edema may be apparent bilaterally or unilaterally, which means that there is poor venous return. And then gangrenous changes may appear after a prolonged severe ischemia. So once your patient had a prolonged severe ischemia, gangrenes are more likely to show up or manifest. Palpation would include palpation of your peripheral pulses. 
okay? And then your central pulses also, that would include your apical pulse, carotid pulse, temporal pulse. Then you have your brachial, radial, ulnar, pupitial, dorsalis pedis, and posterior tibial pulses. Review the location of these pulses as these are importantly to be assessed to your patient. Then, the absence of a pulse proximal to the site may indicate the site of stenosis. So when we say stenosis, that refers to narrowing or constriction. Auscultation. During auscultation, we assess for brewery. A brewery is a signal of aneurysm, or there could be a turbulent blood flow within the blood vessels. Diagnostic evaluation. Among the diagnostic tests used, one is your Doppler ultrasound flow studies. So when we talk about Doppler ultrasound, it is used to detect the blood flow in the vessels. It is also used to measure brachial pressures in both arms. Then we have exercise testing. In exercise testing, the patient is asked to walk on a treadmill at 1.5 mph or miles per hour speed with a 12% inclination for a maximum of 5 minutes. Okay, This test checks for the normal response which is little or no drop in ankle systolic pressure after exercise. Okay, So it checks if there is little or no drop in ankle systolic pressure after exercise. That is the normal response expected in this test. Okay, so again, the, this test measures how long a patient can walk and to measure the ankle systolic pressure in response to walking. Then we have your duplex ultrasonography. Just like your Doppler ultrasound, your duplex ultrasonography is also a non-invasive test. This is a combination of your Doppler and duplex. It involves the B-mode grayscale imaging of the tissues and then your patient's blood vessels are being evaluated. So there is an arterial scan and there is also a venous scan. Patients who undergo this test requires no preparation, except if we are evaluating the abdominal vascular tissues. So if the doctor would request for abdominal vascular duplex ultrasound, the patient is advised not to eat or drink for at least six hours prior to the examination to decrease the production of your bowel gases. The bowel gases can possibly interfere on the visualization of your aorta and other prominent arteries in the abdomen. So your abdominal vascular duplex ultrasound is usually requested if you would want to rule out aneurysm. Then it is also considered to be the standard for diagnosis of your lower extremity venous thrombosis. Then we have your CT scan. So your CT scan provides cross-sectional images of soft tissue and visualizes the area of volume changes to an extremity and the compartment where the change takes place. Okay, so your CT scan would show cross-sectional images of the soft tissues. So in this particular picture, this shows aneurysm okay, in the brain. Then we have your angiography. Just like any other angiography that we've discussed in the previous lessons, this uh, produces an arteriogram, okay, which is a used to confirm the diagnosis of occlusive arterial diseases. Shown on the slide are pictures of arteries with occlusion. Okay, so you can see there that uh, upon the injection of radiopaque dye, okay, the arteries and the blood vessels could be clearly visualized, and then the sites of obstruction could be clearly seen. So since this is angiography, it would involve injection of a radiopaque contrast agent. With the injection of your radiopaque contrast agent, you need to assess first your kidney functioning prior to injection of the contrast. After the test, you need to evaluate also, or you need to instruct the patient to increase oral fluid intake to facilitate excretion of the uh, contrast media. Then we have your magnetic resonance angiography. Magnetic resonance angiography, okay, it's like your MRI, which is used to, eva to evaluate or map your blood vessels. So this is programmed to isolate and visualize blood vessels. So this one allows for visualization in multiple angles. It's like a three-dimensional image of your blood vessels. However, just like your MRI, this is contraindicated with any patient with metal implants, including your pacemaker and tattoos. Then we have your contrast, flipography, okay? Flebography or venography. So this is venography. It inclu includes also injection of the contrast media Okay, or a radiopaque contrast into the venous system. And then successive uh, x-rays are being taken okay, to check the unfilled segment of a vein in an otherwise completely filled vein. Okay, so if they are checking if uh, what part of the vein is not filled, meaning there is a problem or there might be a stenosis. Okay, you inform the patient that injection of the contrast media may cause brief but painful inflammation of your 
pain. Okay, that is brief and painful. That will be the end of your discussion on the assessment of the peripheral vascular system.